Thank you, Dr. Raymond. It's such a blessing to the church, the worship team, and every one of you. Uh, thank you for coming today. I believe that some of you might be sleeping very late last night following the election's results. But thank you for coming this morning. Today, can, can I have the slides off first? Today, I want to respond to the GE15 results. And I want us to respond to this in a godly way. Right? Jesus said this. He said, my kingdom is not the kingdom of this world. Jesus' kingdom is more powerful. Jesus' kingdom is eternal, is unshakable, is indestructible. The earthly kingdoms come, earthly kingdoms go because God appointed them. God brings up kings and princes and he brings them down. So how do we respond to the GE15 results? Because right now we have a hung parliament. How do we respond as God's people to this? So that we will not be despair, discouraged, or so happy that other people lose. How do we respond biblically? How does God want us as his people to respond to this? Yesterday night, I congratulate and I commended Pastor Yan Huat for leading the Penang churches to pray. About 30 over people attended the session. At that time, the counting was just begin, what, what was, had just begun. The results were not out yet. I'm very thankful to this godly man, and he's been providing spiritual leadership, not just to his church, but to the churches of Penang. And I love this brother. And I thank God for him. He called all Christian leaders and the body of Christ to come together and pray. That was so wonderful and it was so wonderful spending time with God. Instead of just walk, looking at our phone and see who is winning and who was losing. But we were praying. And as we progressed, as we were praying and close to about 9 o'clock, it's it something. I felt the Lord was saying to me, declare victory. <laughs> declare victory. And I said, God, what victory, you know? <laughs> and then immediately, Psalm 118 came to me. Especially in verse 15, it says, shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. I felt that the Lord was telling me that the victory has been won. Declare victory. Don't get me wrong, okay, church? God is not saying who is winning, who, who is losing. But I felt that something happened in the spiritual realm yesterday, that the Lord has won the victory, leading to this general election. There has been so much prayer pouring into it, years, months, and weeks, and days into this general election. I felt that last night at about 9 o'clock, God said, declare victory. Because God is winning. God had won, and the spiritual battle had been won in the spiritual realm. 
And I, as I began to reflect on Psalm 118, I began to understand how to respond to the situation. First, God asked us to declare victory. Second, Psalm 118 started with these two words, give thanks. Give thanks. Can we give thanks? And Psalm 118 also talks about do not trust in men. Trust in the Lord because the Lord is our helper. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. So, declare victory, give thanks, trust in God. As I begin to reflect on this, I begin to understand more. And there is one more element in this passage. It says, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. That gave me the key on how do we respond as God's people to this. And God is doing a new thing in our nation. A new dawn has begun in Malaysia. Something wonderful is happening. And this result of GE15 is the beginning of something good and something new. Let me tell you why. It is God's plan that this has ended up in a stalemate. Shocking, right? I say this. The nation has become even more polarized. There's, there is a block of, of Malays, there is a block of Chinese, Indian, there is a block of Christians in East Malaysia. Why is our nation so divided? The answer is this. God wants us to love. God wants us to learn how to love one another. The answer is unity. The key is to have everyone humble themselves and say, we need each other. The, the Chinese don't say to the Malays, we don't need you. The Malays don't say to the Chinese, we don't need you. We don't say to the Kadazans, the, the East Malaysians, we don't need you. We say we need each other. We will come together and we will humble ourselves and look into the needs of each other and learn to work with one another. Let love transcend that relationship. Church, this is God's word to us. And in this season, God has taught me about love. And I, I had to go through of a season of prying. God was just prying out my lovelessness. God said to me, Son, you know how to lead. You don't know how to love. Church, it is time that now we learn to love. We learn to love one another. Because love will overcome evil. You look at how the world is going. It's going in the direction of hate. If Christians, we are not going to rise and be who we are, the city on the hill, the light. Who is going to show the world? We don't participate in hate speech. We don't participate in hating people. 
you know what? What does it mean to be a city? What does it mean to be a light as a Christian? These three words, truth, love, and power. To be a light means to hold up the truth because nobody knows truth these days because everything is like a shifting shadow. It's relative, but truth does not shift like shadows. Truth is a reality. If we are not going to show truth, who else is going to show the world about truth? If we are not going to show love, who else is going to show love to the world? If we are not going to exercise our power, the power that we have, to shift the things in the spiritual atmosphere when we pray. I don't believe that any government or anyone has more power than our God. And the power that our God has, has been entrusted to us as His disciples. He said, all authority of heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go. I send you. We exercise power. Sometimes when things don't happen, we can only blame ourselves. Because we have not exercised our authority as God's people. So in summary, church, we will not be despair we will respond to that situation. God is beginning to build a nation and we are going to play a role in this. And what is our role? Our role is to love. Our role is to shine. Our role is to show the world the truth. And our role is to govern the spiritual realm as God's people. Where we call things to shift this way, it shifts this way. Call things to shift that way, it shifts that way because we have power and authority as Jesus leads us, as we follow Him, as we pray according to His will, things will happen. So this is how we're going to respond. We're going to be rejoicing. There is rejoicing in the tents of the righteous because the right hand of the Lord has done valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. Amen. Amen. We are going to have a great nation, church. Let us pray, okay? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for these wonderful results. We give you thanks, oh God. Because only you can come out with something so genius, oh God, that nobody, no one party or no one block, oh God, can dictate what they want because they have to come to the table to work with one another. Father, we thank you for this, Lord. This is your brilliant, brilliant strategy, oh God. Father, we pray that we will not fail in step too, oh Father, that Lord, you will grant the leaders wisdom and not to be proud, oh God, and to lay down their weapons, not to attack each other, but to learn how to work with each other. Father, I pray that your people in the government, the Christians, those who know you, will show the way that they will be the truth, that they will show love, and they will, they will pray, and they will exercise and invoke your power into changing things in our nation, that we will see Father, a great nation, dawn, oh God, that yesterday was a watershed moment that we can trace back and see something is happening in our nation. Something wonderful is going to happen, Lord. Thank you, Father. May you take control, Father, as the horse trading is, the negotiation is going to go on today. 
Father, may you take control. You will not allow the enemy to come and steal and kill and destroy and cause havoc, oh God. Father, build a fire of protection around what is happening in the negotiation table. Plant the right thoughts in the hearts of the people, oh God, who are in power to negotiate, that they will be steered like water course, oh God, according to your ways and your will and your purposes, O oh God. So we thank you and we bring our beloved country to you. Teach us how to play a role in all this, O oh God. We want to join Jesus in nation building. We thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I ate too much. Yeah. The, my belt is too tight. <laughs> Can I have the slides on? Hallelujah. The title of my sermon today is The Greatest Secret Ever Told. And the text that I will be speaking from is from Mark chapter 4. There is no greater secret that I have heard in all my life than this secret that Jesus had told. Because this secret that Jesus told was revolutionary. It was transformational and it gave human beings great benefits, not just in this life and also in the life to come. And the Word of God tells us in Mark 4.13, that the secret of the kingdom has been given to you. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He was telling them that the secret of the kingdom had been given to you. That privileged few who were called his disciples. And then he went on to say, but to others, to those outside, everything is said in parables. They may be hearing the story, but they may not understand what the secret is. The secret of the kingdom of God. What is it? My brothers and sisters, I want you to think for a moment and write down what is your understanding of this secret. What is this secret that is revolutional, transformational, that gives us so much benefit, that it is so irresistible, that even the pearl merchant search for it, and when he has found this secret, he was willing to trade everything that he had for this. Have you ever discovered something in your life that you live for, and not just live for, but you are willing to die for? My brothers and sisters, if you have not come to that point in your life, there is a likelihood, a possibility that you have not understood this secret. Because this is the greatest secret that was told by Jesus. Today we are going to look at the seed parables. 
There are three parables that are related to seed in Mark chapter 4. Of course, it is also found in other passages. But today, we want to specifically look at the seed parables. Let's start with the first one. Jesus told them this story. He said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. And when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they were withered, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plant so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Jesus said to his disciples, this is the parable of the parables. He said, don't you understand this parable? Don't you understand the parable of the sower? If you don't understand this, he said, how will you understand any parable? Seems like Jesus is saying to us that if you don't understand this parable, which is the parable of all parables, which is the entry level, the gateway to all other parables that I'm telling you, how can you understand all the other parables? So this is a very important parable for us to understand. So what is it? What do we need to understand from this parable? There are three messages from the parable of the sower. I am giving you a summary because don't have time. My right should preach in three messages, but don't have time. It is a certain kind of seed. It is a certain kind of seed. And this seed was sown into a different kind of conditions. It was sown into a, a barren land, a barren place, where nothing that is sown can take root. It's like a wall, it's like a cement. You throw everything there, nothing happens, it will not grow barren. And the second condition is shallow. Yes, it grows, but it doesn't last. And then, of course, some grow amongst the thorns. And of course, the fourth condition is a fertile condition. A condition whereby the seed falls and it produces, it grows, it produces fruit, a harvest of different kind of magnitude. 30-fold, 60-fold, and a hundredfold. So what is the secret? Why is it called? the gateway of all parables. It's a seed. The secret is the seed. What seed is that? What kind of seed that Jesus is talking about? Obviously, Jesus is trying to communicate that secret. Now, what secret? What secret, church? He said, it's a growing seed. 
is a growing seed. He said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or get up. The seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how, the farmer plants a seed into the ground and he, he went to sleep. He wakes up, he went to sleep, he wakes up. He doesn't know how, but the seed started to sprout something out from the ground. He doesn't know how, but all he could say is all by itself, all by itself. The soil began to produce grain, first the stalk and then the head and then the full kernel. Of the, as soon as the, the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it and the harvest has come. It is a seed that grows by itself. We don't know how. It seems like this seed knows how to grow by itself. We don't have to help it to grow. It grows by itself. It grows because it has life in it. A seed that is seemingly useless, encapsulated by, what do you call that? Something that covers the seed, right? but it, it has life in it. It can grow by itself and it can produce grain. So it is a seed and it is a growing seed. It is a mustard seed, Jesus said. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, when planted, it grows to become the largest of all garden plants with such branches the birds can perch in its shade. Jesus said, it is not just a growing seed. It is the smallest seed on the earth. Now, we have to understand the context when Jesus was telling the parable. He was telling this parable to a people which are familiar with mustard seed. In Penang, in Malaysia, perhaps we will use another kind of seed when we want to tell this story so that it becomes relevant to us. In those days, in the marketplace, the mustard seed was the seed that was most insignificant. You don't even realize that seed when you compare with other grain, like rice or corn or whatsoever, wheat or gandum or whatever. In comparison with the rest, the mustard seed is small and is unnoticeable. Jesus says, such is the kingdom of God. It is small, it is unnoticeable. But, it has the potential to grow, to become a big tree. It can become useful to creatures where birds come and perch and have food to eat. It provides to the creatures and to human beings. It can become a shade. It becomes useful. Now, brothers and sisters, what secret is Jesus trying to tell us? It's like a sower, farmer that sows seed. It's a, so a kind of seed. It's a growing seed. It's a small seed. And it's the greatest secret. 
right? All these are found in the Bible. So what's so great about this great secret? What's your answer on your paper? The key to understand this passage is found in Mark 4.14. It says the farmer sows the word. The key to understanding this is in this passage. The farmer sows the word. God gives us the Bible. Go back and read. Read your Bible. Pray every day. Pray every day. Pray every day. And you will grow, grow, grow. <laughs> There are many people who read the Bible. I've known of people who read from young until old. I know of people who study. They know every word and how all this, the knowledge is like, cannot match. You want to argue with them, cannot argue because they know so much. But the problem is such people can miss the whole point. The point is you can have the word, but you may not have the word have you. And it can become barren because it has no effect on us. The key to understand this word is to understand its biblical root, the root meaning of this. The root word for this is logon. Logon, log on. Okay. I have to explain a little bit more. I'm not a Greek scholar, okay? I'm not a Greek scholar, but I study because when I look for answer, because God asked me to preach this sermon, to lay the right foundation, the Holy Spirit has led me to this discovery. The word, if you read John 1.1, 1, 1, okay, the word there is logos. It was used to refer to the person of Jesus. What has logos got to do with logon? I'm not a Greek scholar, but let me attempt to explain. If you read John chapter 1, okay, there is this word called God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, right? You can see the word God, okay? They use two different words. One is, God is Theo, T-H-E-O, okay? But the word Theon, T-H-E-O-N and T-H-E-O-S, Logos and Logon. Okay? And it's used interchangeably to refer to God. And this word logon and logos is a noun and it can be used to refer to Jesus because it is key to understand this passage. It's not asking us to read the Bible. Yes, go and read every day your Bible. But you need to read the Bible in such a fact that it has effects on you and me. Because that word is a person and it has a life in it. Like the seed. It is seemingly 
static. The book is static, but the word has life in it. When you know how to take the word into your heart, it changes you because it is a life. Because it is a person. And this person that lives inside our heart is not obvious. And you and I know that. When we see Jesus, it's not so obvious. It's like the mustard seed. It takes place in our heart without us even realizing it. And when we see people, we look at them, those people who have been touched by God, you see that there is a life of God working in that human soul to change and transform this person. And over time, you see this, how come last time smoking, now not smoking? Last time beat up the wife, now don't beat up. How come there is a transformation in this person? Because the seed, of Jesus indwelling God is transforming. Whether you go to sleep or you wake up, it is what God has planted inside our soul that transforms us. And that is the secret. This is the greatest secret, church, that God came and dwelt inside us. The creator of the universe who does not even have to lift a finger to raise the chair, he spoke. If that's not the greatest secret, I don't know what that is. It is a great secret. And it helps us to grow, grow and grow. It directs our life. Just in case you think that I'm talking out of scripture. Okay, let me give you another passage. Colossians 1, 26 to 27. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Colossae. He said, the mystery, the secret that has been kept hidden for ages and generations is now disclosed to who? Us, the Lord's people. God has chosen us, including the Gentiles, to know the glorious riches of this mystery, this secret. What is that which is Christ in you, the Logos, the Logon in us? which is our hope of glory. To become humble is not to greet our teeth, beat ourselves up. It's not that. It may involve that. But it is also, it is more importantly, have the right understanding. How to host the Spirit of God inside us, how to live with God, how to nurture that seed. This is the greatest secret, church. We can learn lessons 
from the church of Colossae. Paul said this secret was first told to them by Epaphras. He shared with them this secret, this great secret that I just shared with you today. And he said, this is the true message. It is not any other message. It is not any other gospel. It is the gospel of the kingdom that God had come to share with us so that we can share in His glorious riches. And he said about the people of Colossae, he said, you did not only hear it, you understood it. That's the key word. Again, in the parable of the sower, it is the condition of the soil that knows how to Receive that seed. Receive. And not just kick the seed out, but host that seed carefully in the right condition. It, it will grow. It will grow. And... It, for different people, it, it yields different kind of results and magnitude. Some people, it will be 34. Some people will be 64. Some people will be 104. It's talking about our effectiveness, our becomingness. This is the only way we can change because the life of God is in us and transforming us. But we have to work together in a relationship with God. It builds on to what I have shared with you earlier about it is so key that we move away. From rituals into relationship. From just knowledge, doctrine. It's good. Please study your Bible. Please study Greek. Go to seminary. I have no objection. I also want to go. I have plans to go. But more importantly, is our discipleship to Jesus. How do you live with Jesus every day? Don't be a Christian by name. Be Christ-like, church. The goal of the seed is to transform us so that we become like Jesus. We become humble. Summary and conclusion. What is the secret of the kingdom? The secret is simply this church. The life of God is now available for us. Life does not have to be the way we think it is. I shared with you in my last sermon, is life better than what we have Obviously, yes. The key is Jesus. We have to go beyond saying the mumbo jumbos of just the sinner's prayer and live like everybody else. No, that's not what it is. You miss the point. You have the cake in front of you, but you don't know how to enjoy the cake. It's not like that. We have to understand it.
And we have to correctly respond to it. We have to change our, our message. When we tell people about Jesus, we don't say, you want, to, you want Jesus or not? You don't want Jesus, you go to hell, you know. You want Jesus better, better, better want Jesus, you go heaven. Go heaven, don't know what to do. And after, after, no, after I accept Jesus, I don't know what to do now. There's no point. It missed the whole point. We have to understand the message, church. Understand it. Respond to it. There's a likelihood that we don't know how to respond to it because we don't really understand it. If you read more parables, you will find that Jesus introduced the devil. As God sowed this seed of life into our heart, the devil also sowed another kind of seed, the bad seed. We have to be well aware of the devil's activity in our life. Many times he doesn't come wearing a mask that is fierce and red-faced with two horns. It comes with a voice suggesting to us, does God really say that? Can you trust Him? That is how seeds are being sown into our hearts to mislead us. That is why Paul is so against any other gospel. We have to weigh carefully the gospel that we take in. It doesn't matter which Bible that you use, whether it's NLT, KIV, we are not at that level. Use any Bible. The most important measure is use the Bible that can change your life. If the Bible doesn't change us and transform us, it doesn't matter what Bible you use. It doesn't matter which church you go to if it doesn't change your life and my life. Respond to it properly. Because our response to that right message is key. Because it determines our fruitfulness. And once we understood it, we received it, we lived it. Jesus and Paul were the life of God on two legs. They become human beings with the life of God on two legs. The expression of God and the life of God that is changing us. experience it. Church, it doesn't matter how much we know, who we know. It doesn't really matter. Lah. What matters is do we experience this life? Is it real to you? We don't want a faith that it's on paper. It doesn't work. It must work. George Fox, the founder of Quakers, 
say, it doesn't matter about your, what you tell us, doesn't matter, but have you experienced it? God is experiential. It doesn't matter how good the durian is. It is how it tastes, how it gives us that experience. Our faith is real faith. If we understand this, it will revolutionize your life. It will transform you. There is no way that if you understand this secret of the kingdom and it doesn't transform you, not the next day, but it is transforming us. It is a growing seed. It takes time to become a tree. It takes time for us to become useful for God and for other people. It takes discipline. It is a discipline of abiding to God. I keep on talking about this because this is so important. It is pointless if we have God in us and God does not have us. We must learn to commune with God. We must learn to abide in God. We must learn to enjoy His presence. And it takes discipline. Let me go back to understanding it. One good check whether you understand the kingdom of God. It's a very simple test for everybody. If you really understand that God is with you, He's living in you. It's not just beside you. It's not just around you. It is in you. If you understand this, it is very unlikely that you will sin. It is very unlikely that you will intentionally sin. The reason we intentionally, intentionally sin is because of wrong understanding and belief. The Bible tells us that if we dig a hole and hide inside there, God is also there. There is no way we can run away from the presence of God. We are under the watchful eyes of God always, 24 by 7, 365 days. Do we sin? Yes, we sin, but... How do we do that? Because when we lose our focus, our mind has been deceived by the evil one. Nobody will watch pornography if Jesus is sitting beside you. You can't be watching pornography with Jesus with you. There is no way to do that. It is a wrong understanding. If you get your understanding correct, you will know how to live. The last few weeks, I've been doing so badly. Honestly, I, I'm not happy with myself. I became very grouchy. I became critical. I became defensive. I became easily angered. Not patient. Not loving. Not kind. 
it is because something has changed in my work pattern. As a result of that, it took me out from my rhythm of life where I have and I knew how to connect with God. But this rhythm takes me into so many things and causes my mind to be so busy, so many things to do. And my soul began to grow weary. I lost my soul. Lost my soul means I became disconnected with the source, with the life of God in me. Don't get me wrong. I still do my quiet time. My regular, I still do. But it is not enough. I even told God, I said, God, I don't like this. I don't like to be grouchy. I don't like to be defensive. It's killing me. It's killing other people. I can't be. This is unchrist like I don't want to be like that. God, please. I say, God, maybe I can quit my job, you know. Immediately, I hear a rebuke. What, son? Quit your job? God was teaching me a new thing. God was teaching me how to connect with Him. In the in-between time, I learned not to use my handphone or to send any text messages. Whenever I have free time, I connect with God. Hello, God. I want to be with you. I want to enjoy you. I want you, your life, to flow into me. I just want to enjoy and let you love me because I live and breathe your love. If I, I don't have your love, I am finished, God. If I don't have oxygen of God, I am dead. God is teaching me a new thing. Have I done it well? No, not yet. I'm learning. I'm learning about love, love, love people. I can't love people without connected with, without myself being connected with God. Just impossible. I know how to lead, but I don't know how to love. But I need to learn how to love by connecting with God. Once you, you understand it, you respond correctly to it, you live it, you become the life of God on two legs. You begin to experience wonderful things, three things you will, respond, you will, you will, you will experience, truth, love and power. Don't have time to talk about that. But remember this. What is being a light? Being a light means truth, love, and power. And that is what you can share with people to let your light shine. So the, the summary, the point of all points is the secret of the kingdom of God. Sometimes it says the secret of the kingdom of heaven. Get the message right. Get the right message. And get our message right. When we share it with people, it becomes irresistible. I believe that the message of God is good. It is privileged. It is often the messenger. 
But it's okay. We are all on a journey. But this is what we're going to be, church. Our theme is to change. Becoming. Not just rituals have a relationship with God. Not just know Bible study, Bible study, but know how to be a disciple to Jesus, how to live with the unseen Jesus here and now, here on this earth, not go to heaven here. That day is not, doesn't matter. God can turn the stones to become Abraham's children. Doesn't matter if you have a name by Christian. God wants us to be like Him, Christ like. This is what we are called to be as a church. Amen. Let me close. Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seed sown on rocky places. Hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others like seed sown among thorns hear the word, but they were the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of other things come in and choke the word making it unfruitful. Yet others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 60, 30, 60, and some 100 times they were sown. God, may you bless the preaching of your word and may you cause your word to take effect in our hearts and cause it to grow and bear fruit through our lives. May you bless your flock as they go in their separate ways. May they continue to be transformed and changed into your likeness so that they can be presented to be a light to the world, to exhibit truth, love, and power, that they will be stars that shine in the dark universe in this world and glorify your name. I pray and I ask this for them in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week ahead. Pray and continue to pray. And remember, you have the power of God to pray. Amen. God bless you.